A Home for Other Gods, Everything is Under Control by Michael Forrester, Chapter 1 Greg was at work when the waters came. Stationed on the second floor of one of the permit sections building in the city, he first noticed an unorthodox gathering of his co-workers at the window. If it were the 11.15 split break, they would have been in the staff room, and anyway, it was 11.43 and they should all have been back at their workstations long ago. Cautiously, he stood and craned his neck, but was unable to see what they were looking at. Checking furtively to see that there were no sixes or seveners on the floor, he joined the murmuring group standing by the south side windows and looked down to see the water lapping its way up the street from the river, a kilometre to the south. He estimated that the water was still a good half kilometre away from his building, but was nevertheless approaching steadily. Co-workers mumbled uncertainly. No management memo had been received on the subject today. There were no supervisors present to consult, and the staff instruction manual appeared to contain no provision for such an eventuality. Greg found his mind reverting to last year's press articles on the barrage barriers the department had built with such publicly declared a plob, and the increased security they would afford the city. Life is so much better than before, the posters and headlines declared. He was uneasy. Departmental icons regularly reminded him that initiative is danger and to act without instruction diminishes us. Yet, further down the street, co-workers were beginning to leave other department buildings and proceeding at a decidedly hurried pace away from the advancing water. Did they have full section memos from management that had somehow failed to reach the permits? Section Northeast Division 4? Had there been a new edition of the staff instruction manual that somehow he had failed to notice? He drew back from the window and walked towards the relief room to give himself time to think. By the time he returned, all workstations on the floor were unmanned as the full staff of confused co-workers gathered, gathered three deep at the south side window, looking down in concern. Greg took a deep breath to calm himself. Then, in contravention of all his training and all his years of experience, in the absence of supervisorial instruction, he took a decision. It would very probably cost him his job. Conversely, it might also save his life. Taking a last glance at his co-workers growing increasingly animated at the window, he picked up his tablet put it in a satchel and walked calmly towards the swing doors at the end of the large room. The moment he passed through the doors uninstructed, he was in breach of both regulation and culture. No one acted without instructions in the department. Out of habit, he glanced at the management edit notice board on the landing outside the swing doors. At the top of the men be a notice proclaimed that the departmental republic is a happy land and at the bottom it reassured, Be happy, for you labour for the departmental republic. As if in metaphorical declaration, Greg turned away and descended the stairs. As he approached the main entrance, he found the security barriers already deserted and a few hesitant colleagues peering out from around corners. Bereft of instruction, their reticent reminded Greg of worker bees in a queenless hive for level six and seven supervisors were entirely absent. Even at this late stage, he would instantly have obeyed an instruction from such an authority, but there were none to be found. With a monumental counterintuitive effort, he walked through the security screens. Setting off no alarms, he half walked, half ran, straight out of the building. Resisting the urge to fall in with the panic he saw all around him, Greg turned away from the water to head north in the direction of home, the terrain rising as he fled. Approaching the city transport terminal to his considerable surprise, Greg found the system still functioning. The terminal staff, though looking clearly uneasy at the unusual amount of suburbia-bound traffic for this time of the morning, 
had evidently received no instructions to stop the transporters. To Greg's great relief, he jumped on a tram just as the doors were closing. As it pulled out of the station, he watched hordes of panicking co-workers storm onto the platform, some falling onto the live rails of the track. As the tram glided silently towards Suburbia 14, Greg's only thoughts were for the safety of his family. His wife Greta worked as a level 3 medic in the co-workers' health facility, a kilometre from their home. At eight years of age, their pride and joy, Joe, attended the co-student's primary learning facility next door. Both these facilities and their home were on higher ground than the city, so there was little logical reason to worry just yet. The tram passed the ancient ruin, mythical deity worship facility and the abandoned retail park that the department had closed back in 91. Retail is an unnecessary evil. Somehow, Greg remained profoundly uneasy. His eyes alighted on the tram's comms link. It featured the department's current inspirational message, Ask not what the department can do for you, ask what you can do for the department. Arriving at the Suburbia 14 terminal, Greg and the other co-workers poured from the carriage. He literally ran to his live unit and pressed his palm against the lock. The door slid back just as it always did. Greta, he yelled out. There was no answer. But you could hear the Skype wall playing loudly in the lounge. As he rushed into the room, he found Greta and Joe absorbed in the Channel One depth cast. His wife turned to him with shining eyes. Isn't it wonderful? She cried in genuine excitement. Greg was overcome with relief to, his, to see his family together and unharmed. Isn't what wonderful? He managed to stutter out. You've not heard the news? asked Greta. The news about the referendum. What news? What referendum? Tell me what's happening. The Oceanic Union, silly, she replied in, amuse in amusement. The department has announced that they, they have negotiated terms for us to join the OU and we are to have a referendum. What union? Greg responded in confusion. Greta, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. Where has your head been these last few months, my sweet co-worker? She giggled. Oh, pop, cried Joe. Everyone knows the department discovered the Oceanic Union years ago. Greg's wife looked at him with an expression somewhere between love and despair. The depth cast have been reminding us because the department knows airheads like you will have forgotten. All the co-students and co-students got sent home this morning to watch the depth cast bless the department. It's so exciting. Look, pop interjected Joe again, holding up his icon. Greg looked at his son's drawing, no less confused than he had been at his wife's, express, wife's explanation. Uh, lovely, Joe. What is it? It's a fish person, of course, Pop. Everyone at Edfax talking about the fish persons, and I'm Ed Group Rep for the OU this week. Look, I've got a badge. Greg looked at his son's badge, which did indeed bear the words OU education group rep. A fish person? Greg replied, looking at the coloured drawing on his son's screen. As far as he could tell, it was just a fish head on a human body. Yes, his son insisted. It's a co-worker from Oceanic Union. They're amazing. They can swim just by moving their feet and they can breathe underwater and talk, fish speak and, and everything. They're so clever. Co-educator Sam says they'll be arriving soon and we have to draw pictures to welcome them. Look, Pop, I can sing the Oceanic Anthem already. It goes like this. Greg watched as his son stood solemnly to intention, opening and closing his mouth soundlessly. Isn't it great? Joe asked excitedly. Greg was now uncertain. Had there really been announcements by the department about all this? And was it connected in some way to the water rising in the city? He didn't know what to think. But then again, there had been so much he had failed to remember recently anyway. Perhaps they were right. If the department said it was so, so it must be, mustn't it? 
The fault must lie with him. Despite his doubts, Greg smiled and said, Yes, that's amazing, Joe. I remember now. How silly of me to forget. The Oceanic Union. How marvellous that the department has made yet more wonderful improvements in our lives.